All right. Well, welcome everyone to our ScreenCraft virtual pitch session. We're really excited to be here. Um, we have eight pitches from our talented writers. Um, they will be giving live feedback from our incredible judges. The judges will then leave to deliberate, and after they return, they will announce the winner. The eight finalists tonight were selected from more than a thousand global entries, and after multiple rounds of pitching, based on the strength and clarity of their presentation in under three minutes. So congrats are already, you know, making it this far to our finalists. I'm so excited to learn and experience some amazing pitches along with you all today. We are going to hear some amazing stories and we are so lucky to be a part of this event. ScreenCraft's mission is to foster the careers of emerging writers and filmmakers for, by providing inspiration and insight into the craft of screenwriting and the business of Hollywood. The ScreenCraft team has secured script sales, option agreements, meetings, and writing assignments and representation for clients at top agencies and companies like Netflix, CBS, CAA, and WME. So today I will be moderating. I'm Donita, a part of the ScreenCraft team, and I will be moderating the pitch session with all of you today. And I will introduce each of our judges. So our first judge, Daniela Gonzalez, she is a literary manager at Good Fair Content, which is a Los Angeles-based management and production company known for representing generation-defining talent and producing clutter-busting content. Prior to working at Good Fear Content, Daniela was with Circle of Confusion for nearly a decade. Her international background informs her taste as she builds her roster of clients who have unique voices and backgrounds. Our next judge is Tyler Tice. Tyler Tice is a New Jersey native, an art school dropout, and a writer of horror screenplays. His big break came when his script, Day Shift, won the grand prize at the 2017 Slam Dance Screenwriting Competition. It is now on Netflix with Jamie Foxx, Dave Franco, and Snoop Dogg. He's repped by Perry Whit Whitzner at WME and John Z Zorni at Bellevue. And our next judge is Kim Dwinnell. Kim is the author and co-EP on the new Surfside Girls TV show, which premiered on Apple TV on August 19th. Kim is a graphic novelist, author, surfer, illustrator, animator, and professor of animation at California State University in Long Beach. And our final judge, who she really wishes she could be here, she can't be here because she was pulled into a writer's room, was Carrie Drake. Um, she was uh, working on a show and they had to pull her, but she sends her congrats to all the finalists and wish you the best of luck. So thank you so much for being here to our wonderful judges. And we're excited to get started. So I will introduce our first pitchers. So um, we can get started. Um, we have presenting now Jack Flynn and Charlotte Lobdell. The three things that excite them about being writers are blending high and low culture for young and new audi adult audiences, mining their cringiest adolescent moments for content, embracing horror and comedy in a world where everything is both terrifying and absurd. They will be pitching the dead girl next door. So take it away, Jack and Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm Charlotte. Thank you all for the opportunity to pitch our feature, an R-rated teen horror comedy, The Dead Girl Next Door. It's 2001 in Thornbrook, a sleepy northeastern town caught in the grip of its cutthroat head cheerleader, Avery Jacobs. Avery had everything. A hot pink Hummer, a doting jock boyfriend, a loyal cheer squad. She was a lock for prom queen, right up until the night she got struck by lightning. But death can't stop a girl like Avery, and now she's a ghost visible only to her childhood best friend and terminally uncool next door neighbor, Velvet Castle. See, the two girls are astrological twins. They were born on the same day, in the same place, and at the same time. But while Avery grew into the town's golden girl, Velvet became a cynical outcast. The only hookups she has are on The Sims 1, with the Sim who looks identical to Avery. See, beneath her alt girl armor, Velvet's lonely. But that all changes the night she's visited by Avery's ghost. 
who makes Velvet a proposition. Avery will possess Velvet, mind, body, and spirit, transforming Velvet into prom queen material and giving Avery one last victorious night before she moves on to the next realm. It's a win-win. Avery gets her rightful crown and Velvet finally gets some cred. Is it also a Faustian bargain? I guess we'll find out. Avery gives Velvet a makeover, performs unbelievable cheer routines in Velvet's body, and throws a wild house party that launches Velvet to the top of the school's social pyramid. Through this cat and mouse game of possession, Velvet and Avery are finally friends again, and then a bit more. While Velvet grows close to Avery's grief-stricken ex-boyfriend, leading her into a fraught bisexual love triangle. That just might culminate in a ghostly threesome. But this plan isn't all that Avery's executing. Behind Velvet's back, she's murdering and maiming those who wronged her in life or who dare to interfere with her postmortem schemes. Velvet's lost in her sudden popularity until the clues and pile of maimed corpses grow too large to ignore. She realizes she's been played. Avery Jacobs is after so much more than a crown. She's after total possession of Velvet's soul, mind, body, and fucking spirit. And with each kill, Avery grows stronger. Now, if Velvet can't exercise Avery by prom night, she will have lost control of her body forever. The film culminates at the prom. There's an exorcism, some grave robbing, and then Velvet gets the crown and full possession of her body back, right? Well, not so fast. Our twist ending will leave viewers shocked and horrified, or depending on your perspective, thrilled. After all, Avery Jacobs was the most popular girl in school for a reason. The Dead Girl Next Door draws on high school satires like Jennifer's Body, Heather's, Carrie, or Clueless. There's cutting humor, heightened Y2K fashion, and a ridiculous ensemble of secondary characters, like in Mean Girls. But we just might strangle Gretchen Wieners or throw Aaron Samuels into a wood chipper. Our work on the project started after my own brush with death. I recently had cancer, but we got through it together, and we were left wanting to tell a darkly comic coming-of-age story about confronting your mortality. So consider this your formal invitation. A promposal, if you will. Amazing. Thank you, Charlotte and Jack. That was really good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So I will hand it over to the judges to give their feedback. Um, it, Kim, do you want to go first? Um, sure. OK, so first, let me say, like, congratulations, you went first. And that's brave. That's huge. I know um, you guys are super polished in your pitching. And that's really good. And I can see that you um, you love this dark comedy thing. I I got it toward the end. There was a tiny problem for me. And that was tying together how these two people came together the, the, the uh, in the beginning. So as this it, wildly popular very not the like alt girl um who, and they're not friends at the very beginning you didn't sell me on how like the bargain made I wanted to know more about the bargain made I can see this playing out amazingly and I I like I totally get it with the uh, with the, the, the zany cast of characters like I'm very interested to see that I love cutting dialogue I love all of that kind of stuff but for me it took me it took me to the end to understand that setup. And I think you could have pitched that stronger. That's my thoughts. Otherwise, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Um, Daniela, do you wanna go? Yeah, happy to. Great job. I mean, you have a really amazing energy and it was just very clear that for something that was like rehearsed and you've done a lot that it still came very naturally. So um, that was much appreciated. I think similar to um, Kimberly's no, I, I struggled a little bit with the rules of the world of like what the possession is, especially when there are like mounting bodies that are like collecting on the side where it's like if they're able to come to an agreement Avery and Velvet how is it as Avery takes on Velvet's body what you know at what point is or how much does Velvet know especially then when you talk about this ghostly threesome I was like wait then is there an awareness right where it's like there's the corporal then there's the spirit and then there's kind of all all the stuff in between but I think other than that kind of like the rules of a very specific world that you've designed um when you talk about the comps it just kind of like brought me back to what makes this really fun and I think that that gets explained of course in it in the script and all that stuff but other than that I was like this is definitely a movie I would watch. Who doesn't love slasher slasher teens? Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Tyler. Okay. Uh uh that was great first of all. Like I'm going to piggyback on what everybody else said and that you guys that was 
for a man that pitches and I'm terrible at it, you guys are amazing. That was a that was a solid uh, performance. Um, and uh, I agree with what everybody else said as well. It just it just kind of got confusing. I think I didn't really follow along. And I'm gonna kind of um, I'm gonna kind of channel my reps because because I have to pitch to them and channel what they would say. And uh, my manager, he would say that what you have there is a hat on a hat on a hat, where you, it feels like you have a story on a story on a story. And I feel like you could you could really simplify it. But but again, I I love movies like this. I love all the the uh, the influences you cited, and, and I I love horror comedies. Um, and and I feel like you could you're you're capable in this world, and you know this world. But but again, also nobody's buying horror comedies, so so that's so that's tough. And um, and I, I recently pitched something that took place in 2005, and they told me not to do that to uh, to unless there's a reason that it takes place in that era, and not to have it take place in that era to make it present. But and that's it. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for our judges' feedback, and thank you, Charlotte and Jack. Uh, we will send you back to the waiting room. Thank you for your pitches. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, let me admit our next one. All right, our next pitcher is Kylie Forsma. She has some favorite shows that inspired her to write. They are Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Orphan Black, and Alias. And today she will be pitching Bloody Mary. So take it away, Kylie. Thank you, hello. Um, according to legend, we are told to whisper Bloody Mary three times in the mirror of a dark room, waiting for the terrifying apparition of a woman to reach out and claw our faces. But who is this woman we call to? What did she do to earn such a dismal fate, doomed to haunt the minds of scared children from behind a pane of glass? Bloody Mary is the posthumous epithet that was given to the late Queen Mary Tudor, Henry VIII's daughter and England's first queen regnant, who ruled for five years before passing the throne to her much more celebrated sister, Elizabeth. However, the vengeful spirit her name evokes does not accurately represent who this remarkable woman was. And the spirit, the image we have of her is largely due to hundreds of years of anti-Catholic propaganda, misogynistic notions of female hysteria, and a healthy dose of urban legend. The real Mary Tudor story is far more fascinating than that of the whittled down weeping woman we think of today. She was an incredibly intelligent and fiercely strong-willed woman in a time that only valued members of her sex for their connections to powerful men and their ability or inability to bear children. My horror-infused biopic, Bloody Mary, will see the dying queen being haunted by her own twisted and perverted legacy. In her last days, the stubborn and occasionally hot-headed Mary is under immense pressure to name Elizabeth as her heir, knowing that her Protestant half-sister will undo her life's purpose of returning her people to religious salvation, or else risk leaving her country to civil war. At the same time, her fevered mind is relentlessly taunted by the urban legend that she has become to our minds, as well as hundreds of years of preternatural children's whispers, incantations, and sleepover invocations of Bloody Mary that seem to follow her in every mirror. Haunted by the past as well as the future, Mary speaks to ghosts from her youth, including her mother, Catherine of Aragon, who attempts to give her strength, Anne Boleyn, who gloats viciously in the knowledge that her daughter will become queen upon Mary's death, and others who played crucial roles in her fraught and volatile life. Recounting her happy days as a young princess to her bitter years as a bastard, her hard fought battles to remain true to her religion to her miraculous succession to the throne and beyond, even her memories are plagued by accursed whispers of Bloody Mary and the ashes of burnt Protestant bodies. As we journey through the tragedies and triumphs that made Mary, the whispers surrounding her slowly become a maddening din, forcing Mary to confront her late legacy as a monster. It will be up to Mary in the end to pass judgment upon herself. Is she the embittered and sadistic creature of popular imagination? or is she something else entirely? Bloody Mary will beg the question, which is more important, the life you lead or the legacy you leave? And who is ultimately responsible for deciding what that legacy is? History has largely been written by men and Mary has suffered greatly for it. More now than ever before, people are interested in seeing stories that reevaluate the, the way women were and are treated in a society that so often writes them off as crazy and overly emotional. In the context of recent breakthrough hits like The Crown and Framing Britney, Bloody Mary will bring justice to this much maligned monarch who, who the victors of history have reduced to a ghostly reflection in the mirror and the monster of a children's tale. Ever since I first learned about her in the sixth grade, something about Mary has always called to me. Through the lens of horror, I want to tell a story with her that is familiar on a collective cultural level, but also deeply personal and shocking to those who do not know the real Mary, giving this old ghost story a whole new life. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. It's such a wonderful job and an interesting story that I didn't think of before. <laughs> a good thing. 
That was cool. Um, yeah, I'll hand it over to Daniela. Hi, Kylie. Nice to meet you. And thanks for giving me a uh, understanding of the origin story of this. So it's always nice to walk away from the pitch feeling like I've learned something. Um, I think my first piece of advice when you're giving a pitch is to like take a deep breath. I could just tell that you had a lot of information that you wanted to spill out and like there is a time constraint, but I felt like I was like trying to catch up with you. And I, in a way, it made me lose kind of sight and focus on certain things that you were describing, um, especially with contextualizing who this woman was and her relationships. Um, and I think at, at points I felt like you were assuming that the, um, the judges or whoever's listening to this understood kind of like the monarchy or the, the historical context of this time. So when you were talking about her legacy, um, Protestant, Protestantism, that's not the Protestants versus the Catholics. Um, I, I kind of felt like I was like, I needed more of those details. I think more importantly though, um, while you're talking about something very historical, the parts that I was really leaning into had to do with kind of that, the horror aspect of this. We haven't seen a lot of horror biopics um, and like getting that opportunity to infuse a genre element, but I it didn't have a full scope of kind of like what were the machinations of like the plotting underneath the like emotional undercurrent of who this woman was. Um, so in a way I was like, I understand the, the summary of, of what you were talking about, but in terms of like, what am I watching um, and those beats, I felt a little bit lost. But otherwise, like I said, I'm like, I don't often leave a pitch being like, I learned something new. So that's a, a great takeaway. Thank you. All right, uh, Tyler. Okay, um, yeah, I uh, I really like the idea and I, I love the story of Bloody Mary and I, I love that you wanted to do this historical horror, which I think would be really fucking cool. Um, I just, uh, in, in your pitch, I just didn't really hear where the horror, ca horror came from. It, I, I like the world that, that you, you, you painted and, and I like that it's gonna be, it, it would, you know, mix within this true story of Bloody Mary, but I just didn't see where where the where the horror was. It just sounded like you were pitching a um, a uh, like just like a you know something like The Crown, just like a, a historical movie. And I wouldn't have known there was horror unless you told me there was going to be horror in there. So that's that's my only criticism. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the the horror I hope would come from her. Actually, like she's literally being haunted by her herself and her these these like girls from the, these girls playing you know Bloody Mary in the future and whatever. It's it's like a reverse haunting was kind that's of really idea. that's really cool. Like yeah, I I feel like you I didn't get that from what you you pitched, but that's that's actually really really cool. <laughs> so so that's what I add that. Uh, Thank you. All right, Kim. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I think you've got something here. I've got, you've got like a really good uh, person to look at and a really good story. And I like all the things you've said about like how she's been portrayed and how we don't know about her. And, and that whole bloody, I mean, who has not at a slumber party done that bloody Mary thing and freaked yourselves out. Right. And I think making those connections between like exploring her personality and it came from this those two two ingredients in the soup just totally sparked my attention. But like the others were saying, once you got into it, I'm like, wait, is this a is is it a historic like is this a historical thing? Are we watching this historically and then horror, or is it is it like from the future or from now? You know, looking at it through flashbacks. Like I'm not, I don't, I'm very visual, and I don't know how I see this. I'm not quite sure how it plays out. I like the ingredients but I can't see how the story is playing out. And, and I think for that reason, I was just a little bit lost, not in your idea, because I think your idea is fantastic, honestly, but I think in the way, um, like tell me how, to, how, how this is gonna look because horror biopic, those words are also really good, but I don't think you illustrated to me what exactly that looks like. Like if I were to draw that, I'm not quite sure where we would start and where we would end. Um, but I think that's just shoving things around. I think you've got a good a good thing here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Kylie. That was an amazing pitch. All Thanks. right. We'll see you Thanks back to the room. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
All right, let's bring up our next picture. Okay, next we have Georgia Sampson. This is from Georgia. Though I'm primarily drawn to writing and watching TV, the script that made me want to be a writer was Heather's. Maybe it's because I had a crush on young Christian Slater, or maybe it's because I love the twisted sense of righteousness. But I will never forget the drama of watching Heather Chandler, Chandler crash into a glass table and die. I think I've been chasing that drama ever since. Georgia will be pitching Diary of Mafiosa. M Mafiosa, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. Thank um, you, Georgia. Thanks, Danita. Hi. Um, thank you all for listening to us pitch today. I don't know if you have a weird sense of draw to true crime like I do, or if you're a feminist, or maybe you just really love the Godfather movies, but either way, if you do, I have a show for you. Today, we're gonna to be talking about my series, Diary of a Mafiosa, which follows, which is inspired by the life and crimes of Virginia Hill. It follows a Senate research assistant in the 1950s as she uncovers the story of the only high-ranking woman in the mafia, or rather the only mafiosa in the mob's history. So the pilot opens and it's 1950s in the Senate. So just think old white buildings full of old white men, but we're not really focused on them right now. We're focused on our main character, Eileen Streeter. She's the first ever female research assistant in congressional history. So she takes her job very seriously, but she kind of gets relegated to doing male duty for the upcoming investigation into organized crime. Her male counterparts are uncovering the Don Corleone's of the world, but she's opening envelope after envelope until she comes across one from Virginia Hill. So Virginia, our anti-hero, if you will, is a rebel and a badass who will do anything to save her own skin, which is kind of how she ended up working for Al Capone in the 1930s in Chicago. Flashback to then, and we see that her life was kind of like Goodfellas, but had speakeasies and, and bootleggers, and she did everything for the mafia. She dated every shady guy, she did every shady thing, but cut to now, 20 years later, and she's completely cut off. That's because the minute that Virginia got pregnant, all of her mafia contacts decided to stop sending her jobs and money. So to retaliate, Virginia writes the Washington Post and asks to sell her diary, which is full of her life story and all of her mob secrets in exchange for money and protection. But the Post doesn't take the story. They just forward it to the Senate investigation where it lands on Eileen's desk. Eileen rushes to take it to the head researchers, but they just kind of shrug it off. They say a woman would never last in the mafia. So this is probably all made up. But Eileen disagrees, so she follows her gut and she chases the mafiosa. The rest of the show follows Eileen as she researches her way to Virginia's doorstep. But what she's shocked to discover is Virginia, this villainess mafiosa that she's been dreaming in her head that kind of started Sin City and followed mobsters all over the world is actually just a person. See, Virginia was just a young girl that got shoved into a system that was overruled by men and started doing things that she never imagined she could do. Just as Eileen starts to feel for Virginia, Virginia gets called to the Senate hearings. See, while Eileen was doing all the research and sending everything back to Congress for proof, the men who told her that it was completely impossible actually started taking credit for her work. So Virginia has to go before the public broadcast and sit in front of the Senate and announce her connection to the mafia. And of course, mafia men everywhere are listening. So there's a massive fallout for this, a fallout so big that Virginia has to flee the country, but she still needs help because her diary is out there and full of secrets and mob stories that nobody has heard of yet. Will Eileen step in and help the mafiosa or will she just sink right back to her life in Congress? Well, we'll kind of have to wait to find out. This series will have audiences on the edge of their seat as we root for people we never expected to like, like Virginia and Joe Epstein, who is Virginia's only true friend in the mafia and a secretly gay mobster, but it'll also have romantics and moments and have us swooning over the relationship between Eileen and Oliver, a fellow research assistant who she mistakenly falls in love with. As I mentioned before, it has a huge draw from anybody who's into true crime, but also anybody who's ever been into a mafia movie before and thrill seekers alike. But deep down, this show is actually for women everywhere who have ever felt like they've been out of control in a patriarchal system. Whether it's the mob or the Senate, we realize that the only way around a true boys club is to live like a mafiosa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia. That was amazing. Um, love that take on the mafia. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, I will hand it over to Tyler. 
Yeah, that 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 was awesome. That I would uh, I would watch the shit out of that show. Thank um, you. And, and I I thought you pitched it really well. It was uh, it was very conversational. Like it felt like we just like sat down and then you told me about this show that you're watching, and I was like, oh shit, I want to watch that too. And, and I thought that was great. It wasn't so practiced. Then you, it wasn't like you were just like vomiting a bunch of information on me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and I really like the idea. I, I love all the different layers to it. I, I'm a hu huge fan of mafia movies. So I, I can see all there. Um, my only question is, would you have it be like, like there would be flashbacks to Virginia when she was younger? Now, would those flashbacks be true or would they be like the other, the other girl's perception of what happened? So the interesting thing about the Virginia Hill case is we only know the surface of it because the diary was actually lost after the investigation. So a lot of it would be something that you can kind of make up. So you can start with like true things, but you can also kind of venture into, well, this is something I've heard that they do in the mafia or like, this is just something I dreamed up the other night. So you could really go a lot of directions with it. Yeah. I mean, I guess my only critique would be to just to explain that more, how you're going to okay. jump around in time yeah. and just show it and show the, you know, what the, the, you know, the perspective, do we have an unreliable and hourly rater, something yeah. like that. Oh, totally. That's yeah. A great job. Thank you. Okay, hey, Kim, you want to go? Yeah, I would. I would second that completely. Um, you were very clear. Um, I have. I don't really have questions. I feel like we're having coffee, and you're like, "Oh my gosh, you've got to watch the show on Netflix." <laughs> I love it so much, and you just tell me about it. And um, I like all the things you talk about. I also love the fact that you've put these two women in similar situations. One crime and one politics or is that crime too I don't know but you've compared their situations and um and I think all of us women kind of know what that world feels like and so from that perspective especially I am super interested um I think you've got a, a great thing here I I've got no critique I just think you did a great job thank you hey Daniela yeah, this is definitely the type of show I would watch. It's uh, you did an incredible job pitching it. I think the one thing, especially when you're looking at like a series, I could see the stakes for Virginia, right? Like the, here's this woman about to expose the mafia and it's about survival. It's about protection. And then Eileen, up, up until the point you talk about how the men start taking credit for her work. I was curious, just kind of like, what are the stakes for her where she takes her job so seriously, where you're like, she's the first woman to be doing this job. And so in some regard, is her seeking out Virginia color, like operating in the margins, is that something where she's always feeling like that's her internal dilemma and her internal conflict? Because in order for that parallel of like, here we are politics, here we are mafia, and like, this is what it is to be a woman in a man's world. I think that that's really going to help you stick the landing with Eileen and not have her just be the device of like, this is who we're learning about Virginia through. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. But otherwise, it was great. Thank you. Yes, that was wonderful, Georgia. Thank you so much for your pitch. A great job. Yeah, have a good rest of your day, you guys. Nice to meet you. <laughs> All right, bye. bye. Okay, I will add our next picture. Okay, our next picture is Leo Demi Green. And these are three things that excite them about being a writer helping anyone feel less alone and connecting with the queer and trans community in particular through both truth telling and laughter the opportunities for close connection with collaborators with collaborators on projects and the sheer joy and freedom that transports themselves when they're writing and how they sip into a waking dream that thrills them they will be uh, pitching Journey to the Enchanted Inkwell. Take it away, Leo. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. So glad to meet you all. Um, so when searching for an enchanted ink that rewrites history, a queer nun with the sight in medieval Europe falls in love with a gender fluid swashbuckling nun. Together they must battle an ancient prophecy that threatens not just the relationship, but their dignity and identity and the entire world. Journey to the Enchanted Inkwell is an elevated genre feature and graphic novel about queer and trans inclusion. It's also an action adventure, a fantasy and a romantic comedy. 
So first we have Charlotte, who is this restless, imaginative woman stuck in the confines of a stuffy abbey until one day she receives this vision from Julian of Norwich, who is a mystic woman from England, who is based on a historical figure, who calls her on this quest to find the enchanted ink that rewrites history. Now, at first she thinks she can't go because if she leaves the abbey, she'll never be able to go back, but she is determined because she really wants to rewrite and undo a painful incident in her past. So she hits the road and the first night out, she meets Etude, who is this dashing, dapper, dandy, gender fabulous, non-binary nun who also sword fights and charms Charlotte quite a bit, but she does her best to hide it. So they set out together for practical purposes, of course, and uh, while all the while they're totally unaware that their actions are being orchestrated by sinister monks, these two secret feuding orders of sinister monks and female knights, both of whom wield the power of this ink. So to get by on the road, Charlotte and Etude gamble, they sword fight, they flirt with disaster and with each other. And just as they are starting to feel safe, the monks make their manipulations known. Charlotte is totally freaked, Etude soothes her, and their budding attraction blossoms into passion. However, this is short-lived as Charlotte thought she was only into cis women and is a little unsettled by Etude's gender. Meanwhile, the female knights also make themselves known to Charlotte, and it turns out they are bigoted towards Etude's gender. So this all builds up to the final battle where Charlotte must decide if she's going to use the enchanted ink to rewrite the painful incident in her past, or if she'll use it to stand by her first real love. And this choice could alter the history of the world. As a trans and non-binary person myself, I have felt significant relationships in my life shift due to my transition, much like my characters. But also like my characters, I know the immense power of allyship and queer community and love. In this time of banned books and banned bodies, this story with its wide appeal, trans empowerment and queer joy could help us build a more loving and inclusive culture. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Leo. That was amazing. Thank you. I will hand it over to Kim. Well, thank you for that that fun pitch. That was super fun. Um, I I will tell you. Okay, so I was taking some notes. Uh, so I love your characters very much. I, I like I could see, and I write and illustrate graphic novels, and I see this as a graphic novel. Like I see what this looks like. Um, it's zany. It's wacky. I I love I I love. Her getting called out of the Abbey, I love this swashbuckling, not like, like, bam, you've got some weirdness. And I really, really appreciate that. I have a couple Thank questions. Uh, okay. The first question is, okay, the, the whole ink that rewrites history. I love that. Um, you know, all of us writers love that, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I didn't feel like it was uh, the compulsion. With, I, I want to know what the incident was. I almost feel like a personal incident would not maybe not have sparked that journey. I feel like there might have been a bigger incident, um, earth shattering incident that sends this person, Charlotte, on the quest. Okay. I just felt like that needed to be a bigger impetus. Like, you know, like, oh, I got a bad turkey. I'm, I'm not making fun of this, but I've got a bad yeah. turkey sandwich. I'm going to rewrite that. Like, I want to know it was earth shattering. Yeah, and for I sure. Kind of, I kind of felt like it was just a, 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 a painful incident that, that does not get me out of the abbey. So yeah. Right there. That's just a sure. thing. Now, the other thing that I have to say, like, I love their relationship. I love what they're getting into. Um, the whole bringing in the monks and, and all that, that feels big and overwhelming to me. I, and I don't know, what, I, I don't know how the rest of the story plays out, but I'm kind of more interested to know the adventures of these two on their own. Um, mm -hmm. so I know that uh, obviously you're going to have to have a climax. It, it felt a little disconnected and big to me what you pitched, but I think your start and your setup is, is magnificent. And I think your characters are wonderful. So oh, I thank think you so much. Yeah. I think that, um, in my, in my estimation, uh, the impetus for their journey and their relationship, um, solved, you know, um, uh, what, and what happens to them on the road is where my interest is. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for your feedback. You're welcome. Good pitch. Thank you. All right, Daniela. Leo, your passion for this is like palpable. 
Like I really appreciated that. And even with your sort of personal statement at the end and even the relevance of this right right now in this political climate, I was just like really, I was like leaning in. I'm like, where can I read this? Like it was very, very, uh, I, I just commend you because I think it can it can feel very overwhelming with something that requires a lot of invention and ambition. And to Kimberly's point, I was falling in love with this relationship with the nuns and that that they the two of them were kind of coming from these two separate worlds had reason to be together. Um, Thank you. I, uh, you're welcome. Um, I think for me, uh, when you started off and, you, you know, it is in, in the title, but kind of like the mechanics of how this ink works. And then later on, when you talk about how the monks and the female knights have control over this ink, mm -hmm. uh, I sort of was like inventing things in my mind so that I could track why or how they were uh, and like filling in the blanks essentially. And so I think it's imperative within the pitch as you're establishing those stakes that you have a very personal journey for your two main characters. Mm -hmm. but the stakes are going to be that high to explain like why is it that the monks and the female knights uh, not just because of their own prejudice against the identities of these two individuals, but for them to feel like, you know, are are they trying to rewrite history? Are their interests conflicted? To yeah. Because um, otherwise it, it kind of feels so sprawling to hear Rilly's po point that I, I wanted to continue that intimacy that you have with the relationships with the plot of the story. But otherwise I was like, sign me up. You know, like, it kind of didn't matter like where they were going or what they were doing. I was like, I just want to be in their relationship and see oh. how they're just empowering one another. Um, so that was what was really powerful about your pitch. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for those notes. All right, Tyler. Yeah, I, the the world you created is so much fun, and it's a it's a it's a world that you know, and I, I love world building, and I feel like you know every aspect of this world, and it's 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 just a world that that I would like to go to. I think it, it, and. Uh, and, and I love that it's, it's a quest and a love story at the same time, because I, I love movies like that. I just feel like in your pitch, you got to the part, like the part about the, how it's going to be a quest and a love story came at the end after kind of all these rules that you set up for the world. And I kind of got lost and confused. And then I'm like, oh, OK, it's a quest where I would kind of kind of, I don't know, pitch it differently, where you kind of pepper in the rules throughout the pitch of the story. That's just. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for those notes. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Leo, for your wonderful pitch. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Okay. Now let me bring up our next picture. All right. Our next picture is Tommy Hellringer. Tommy grew up in a Catholic uh, oh, Tommy grew up as a Catholic in Kentucky and a middle child mouth breather with a penchant for Madonna. He's here to pitch pig and bear. Take it away, Tommy. Hi, all. I'm Tommy. I knew I was gay the moment I opened my dad's underwear drawer. But as they say, it gets better. I'm sexually compulsive. <laughs> yeah. I have diagnosable issues surrounding sex, addiction, and intimacy. I live with mice. But from the darkest night came the dawn. I flipped the script and created a show based on my misadventures, turning heartache into some truly horrific humor. Tell me, what happens when a sex-hungry pig and a love junkie bear walk into the Big Apple? That's right, bitch. You get the adult animated queer buddy comedy series, Pig and Bear. It's Fleabag meets Bojack Horseman. Meet Pig, a sexually compulsive, overeaters anonymous humanoid pig. You know the type, always looking for the next playpen. He doesn't care who's back there pounding him out as long as there's an apple in his mouth. And I meet Bear, he's a loving, lovable lug of a humanoid bear with a huge heart and equally huge craving for all things L-O-V-E. Now, these two hapless homos are all they have in the ways of family. 
After five years apart, Pig and Bear reunite in NYC, and we follow them each half-hour episode as they desperately try to keep each other out of trouble and on the path to recovery one day at a time. Their fellowship passes the ultimate test, however, when, now listen to this, in the season finale, Pig turns down a Pride Weekend pig roast, or spit roast, in order to save Bear from a hunting trip run by log cabin Republicans. Well, isn't that something? But through it all, Pig and Bear make each other laugh as they celebrate life's shitty little victories. Let's face it, hitting bottom is hard. At least together, these two fudgebackers can land on the solid ground of each other's love and friendship. Pig and Bear transports us into a bizarre, hilarious universe where two anthropomorphic animals coexist with humans in contemporary society. Playing off the gay terms, Pig and Bear explodes that notion into fully fleshed out humanoid characters. And even more critically, the series shifts the lens on our LGBTQ community away from the fabulous dinner parties of our wealthy gay architects, doctors, lawyers, and onto those queens who happen to work hourly and fly basic economy, thank you very much. Queers who, if you can believe it, pass gas, eat Doritos, and occasionally, have less than mind-blowing sex. So go get your poppers ready for this funny, shocking, and disarming series that goes balls deep into life's big quandaries like disappointment, despair, and how much is too much douching. No, but let's get real. Why do we care about pig and bear? Because at the end of the day, it's a uniquely queer, entirely universal story about the sobering power of friendship. Despite their flaws and maladaptive behavior patterns, these two assholes remain each other's emergency contact. And who the fuck doesn't need a friend like that? Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. That was hilarious. <laughs> Great job. Great job. Uh, I'll hand it to Tyler. <laughs> that that was awesome. That you uh you pitched the fuck out of that thing. <laughs> like, like you were like uh you're like an old sale. You're like a salesman. Like you were like a presenter, like to, like telling me to watch the show. And I was just mesmerized. And the, the, the idea for the show is awesome. I, I've never seen anything like that. And it sounds like the humor is right up my alley. And uh, I, I don't have anything bad to say. That was great. Oh, thank you, Tyler. Yes. Um, our attitude, Daniela. Yeah, I mean, I usually try to keep a poker face, but you broke me throughout that entire pitch where I was just like giggling and laughing and it felt like the right amount of naughty. But also when you're talking about their friendship, I was like so intrigued by the dynamics. And it reminded me like you you said Bojack Horseman, but it also reminded me a little bit of like Tuka and Birdie too. Um, when you jumped to season finale, if I had one note and you jump to season finale about how kind of this like conflict of like what pig sacrifices in order to rescue bear. I wanted a little bit more insight over like what the episode to episode, especially if it's serialized, if that was like what you imagined that setup being once they're like moving into the city and it's kind of like, this is going to be the driving conflict of like what, how are the walls closing in on them as they're dealing with their demons? Um, but and other than that though, I was just kind of like, I, where do I sign up? So uh, you did an amazing job. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think you really, really know your world. Like you speak the speak. Um, and and the way you presented this is is so stinking funny. Um, I, I don't hide my emotions well. So you have me definitely cracking up. Um, I, lo I love the relationship. I kept getting these flashes of that children's book, like Frog and Toad, but like the other version, <laughs> you know, and I think I think that's that's such a funny thing that you've done. Um, I guess uh, the like you were very thorough and you you sold it um, when you when you initially said they go to New York City. I I just wanted I think I wanted a little bit more about like how they landed, how they have how that happened, and how they what, what did they go together? Did they uh, did they meet by chance? And I wanted to know if that was orchestrated or or, or whatever. And I I think um, that would help me understand them moving forward and and conquering the Big Apple, uh, how they got there. Other than that, I like you were super clear and you were super funny. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very helpful.
Yes, great job, Tommy. Thank you so much for giving your pitch. Bye, thank you. Bye. Okay, let's bring up our next person. Hello, everybody. Hi. Okay. Next up, we have Cello. And Cello's favorite show growing up was Martin. Even though the show came out years before he was even born, he still watched the DVD box set of it constantly. It was the first time he's, he's seen representation of Black people within comedy and is a big reason he created his pilot, Big Boy. Shows like that gave him a space to feel like he's, his voice mattered and that people of color deserve a show that can make them laugh when they need, need one the most. He will be pitching Big Boy. Take it away, Cello. Thank you, thank you. Hope y'all enjoy my pitch. Hey, yo, my name is Cello C. Houston. I'm currently a college student in Berkeley, California, and my whole life I've been overweight. And growing up as a fat black kid in Oakland public school systems is harder than you might think. I've heard every fat joke you could think of. It's always affecting me on a deeper level. So I wrote a show about it. I'm the writer and creator of Big Boy. Um, Cal Big Boy Lewis is a per is a Cal Big Boy Lewis is the only fat person in a world full of perfectly in shape people, a world where everyone looks like supermodels but eats food like it's going out of style. He's got a rare condition called fat ass syndrome, but that doesn't stop him from trying to chase his dreams of becoming a famous actor. Only problem is no one is willing to cast him. To the rest of society, Cal is viewed as a monster rather than the only man he is. But Cal's luck changes when he meets Gina, a fellow fat ass syndrome sufferer who's like a ball of positivity and sunshine in human form. But she has a lot of secrets and even her own mental health struggles. She's like Ted Lasso, but even more charming, yet very flawed. Together, Cal and Gina embark on a romance that's sweet, hilarious, and full of surprises. Around the same time, Cal finally gets the role of a lifetime as the lead in a big budget romantic comedy after a big time director writes a role specifically for him in a movie called Big Boy in Love. The first season of Big Boy revolves around the growing romantic relationship between Cal and Gina and how his dream acting role is now imitating life for better and for worse. Just when things starts to go well, Gina introduces Cal to the hidden community of fat ass syndrome people that she grew up with, including Cal's own estranged father. The first season is filled with huge moments like when Cal joins a reality dating show filled with beautiful morons or when Gina gets robbed the same day she opens up her very own ice cream truck. The first season is filled with to the rim with heart, comedic gags and a ton of social commentary. Further seasons would dive deeper into the chaotic mind of our two leads, Cal and Gina. Like Cal going to therapy for the first time and having a, and having a Keanu Reeves type playing his therapist, or Gina struggling with body shaming and abandonment issues after being invited to the world's first to be the world's first plus size model in London. There will even be episodes that are genuinely dark in nature, with Cal having to fight for his life against people that cause. Him, that, that wants to cause him harm because he's just simply different. All of this builds into explosive finales where the relationship between Cal and Gina is pushed to its limits, but they always find a way to persevere. This shows a mixture of Ted Lasso and The Last Man on Earth meets Insecure and BoJack Horseman. Big Boy is an incredibly, is an incredibly personal story for me. I actually plan to play the character myself, but it's not just for people who are overweight. It's for anyone who has ever felt like they don't... Um, uh, it's for um sorry uh it's for it's for it's not just for people who are overweight it's for anyone who has ever felt like they don't fit in whether it's your nose your skin color your sexuality or whatever big boy is here to help you embrace who you are and feel comfortable in your own skin while making you laugh my focus was on was on showing the life of a person with a distinct look that makes them feel separate from the rest of society but finds the only other person on earth that can relate making everything slightly better at its core, it's a story of two outcasts, one that has always been looked down upon because he was too different, and one that was foolish, uh, and one that was looked at as foolish because she wasn't different enough. And now they're finally finding love and respect that they've always dreamed of within each other. But like anything in life worth having, it won't, it won't be easy. Big Boy is ready to make you laugh, cry, and have a little hope that one day we'll all meet someone or something that will make us, that will make being normal seem weird as hell. 
Thank you all for listening. I'm a big fan of all of your work and I hope you enjoy my pitch. Thank you so much, Cello, and great job. Thank you. Um, I will hand it to Daniela. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I feel like you starting with a personal statement and really then jumping into the world, like settled me into what this was about. And even at the tail end, like anytime it was, it was personal and you talk about something universal of what does it mean to fit in, but then through this very specific lens is what I think is why I was attracted to the idea. I'll admit I was getting kind of like lost in sort of like the mechanics of the world because you describe Cal as the only person who's big in this like supermodel like everyone is a supermodel and maybe I was taking that too literally but then when you talk about Gina and then the support group um, people who have fat ass syndrome I was like okay wait hold on maybe they're more like him in this world so that it, it just kind of was a little bit disorienting to try to understand like the full scope of how Cal felt othered in this world um but then I think too, there was a, an aspect of like what the um, plot driver was of like, Cal has now been given this opportunity as an actor because a filmmaker like wrote a role specifically for him. Then later on, you talk about this reality show that he's on. And so it, it kind of felt as though the, how active he was as a character, it didn't feel like he was active. It felt like a lot of the things were in reaction to um, like opportunities that presented themselves. So I would just say in terms of like, because the show and the titular good like role of big boy is Cal to find a way to like always reinforce that he's a very active character who's kind of taking on life on, on his own because at the times that you talked about Gina, I was so much more interested in who Gina was and what she had to offer, but it's not her show. It's like they're, it's like the two of them together. Um, so that would just be my advice, like making sure that Cal's character doesn't get lost in response to all of the other character dynamics that you're setting up. Thank you, I agree, thank you. Okay, um, Tyler. Okay, I, I love how you, uh... You made this this comedy show from from your insecurities. I think that's uh that's the best comedy, and, and I feel like you understand the realm of the sitcom in uh in, in your little uh your pitches of different shows that that you would you would have. I really enjoyed that, and, and I thought your pitch towards the it's I wouldn't have I would have memorized it. Like I, I, the pitch was good. It's just um it's just you reading it. It, it, it took me out of it, and there are times where you kind of like. You kind of caught your, uh, you, you know, you you kind of got your 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 flow down, and you, it seemed natural. And I started following it, but it would take me out when you would start reading it again. So in the future, I would I would memorize, write it down, and memorize it. Just read it over and over again, and put the notes away, and just do it the best you can, or just keep the notes to your side, just to kind of glance at. But the the reading off the screen was kind of distracting, and it, it kind of took me out of it a little. Thank you, thank you. Kim? Um, okay, so like I was hooked in the first sentence that this is a show where there's only one plus size person in a world of supermodels. And automatically that told me that this was a wacky and zany made up world uh, that was hyperbolic. You know, there was, there's all kinds of weirdness, but then the weirdness never happened for me. I think, like, I, I love that. I, I love that thought. Like, how weird would that be? Like you are the only, and, and I stuck to that only. And like Daniela said, but then there's another one. And then there's a, like a secret group of them. So there wasn't an only, but going on that theory of, you know, maybe what the one only meets the other one that didn't know exist. And you've got this bizarre world. I, I thought the, 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 the day-to-day, -day, the, the, uh, goings on would be zanier. They would be more over the top. They would be a little bit more ridiculous. Um, so I think your, your heart is right. I think your emotion is right. But I think uh, in the same way, like inside job is just absurd, right? Like just like it's a bizarre and absurd world. I felt like I wanted to know that more bizarre and absurd made up world. And I never really felt it. It, it kind of went on to just more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more of how people feel, which which needs to be at the heart of everything. 
but um but in the same way that star trek tells us who we are through this bizarre made up world i want to see your bizarre made up world a little stronger thank you um the the show is uh the show is a very um like kind of like what you said like very bizarre and crazy and very uh like out there and so um but i just wanted to have be almost like a romantic comedy at times with these two people trying to figure it out together so thank you i just thank you thank you so much cello thank you great job thank you all right, let's add our other picture. Okay, next up we have Maggie Mayfish. Maggie's biggest inspiration for writing is, and she said she's going to be cheesy and say her mom, I feel like that's totally not cheesy. <laughs> um, her dad instilled her love of film. Um, with when they were watching the godfather together when she was seven um but she says my mom was the one who loved horror her favorite movie was rosemary's baby and her eyes would sparkle whenever she recounted to me that month's idea for a great horror story maggie is pitching below take it away maggie so when I tell people about blow I usually say that it's about a sex blow-up doll that kills people because it is. But to me, doll represents a fear that I don't often see in horror movies, even though it's always lurking in the background. Growing up as a young, closeted, queer woman, the thing that scared me the most was the way that men saw me, the way that they could look at me and only see an object. I grew up in a very small town, much like the setting on this film, and watching boys grow from our best friends into the judge and juries of our worth was terrifying. And I mean, just look at her, you know? <laughs> and so the story of Blow follows Detective Sylvia Bloom, a mother of two, investigating a string of missing men from her hometown while her personal life is falling apart. Sylvia was recently outed as gay at work and her male coworkers in the police department do not handle this maturely. She's clearly in love with her best childhood friend, Tarana, but Tarana doesn't wanna start a relationship while Sylvia is still on the force. And as Sylvia follows her leads, the families of the missing men are suspiciously uncooperative. That is until the midpoint when Sylvia learns about Doll, an otherworldly being that you can summon to enact revenge if someone's hurt you and you haven't received justice. Bury a childhood toy in the backyard with a bit of your blood and Doll will take care of the rest. Now, of course, Sylvia doesn't believe in Doll at first until she uncovers a stash of sex crimes that have been hidden by her coworkers. And on the report, she sees the names of every missing person that she's been looking for. And Doll begins to hunt Sylvia too. In the last act, Sylvia arrives at Doll's house to confront her, but turns out Doll might have something to confront Sylvia with as well. And maybe Sylvia's own hands aren't as clean as she thinks. Just as the men in the film often see women like me or Sylvia or Tarana as one dimensional, Doll is also more than meets the eye. And if Sylvia can see that for herself, she might have a chance at redemption and forgiveness. Blow is part horror film, part psychological thriller with a healthy dose of queer camp, all coming together to form a deliciously fucked up cocktail. It's about what it feels like to be the object of the male gaze, about filmmaking's history of systematically excluding women and non-binary people from being in control behind the camera, and what justice even looks like in an unjust system. In my many years of being a woman, I have learned a misogynist's worst fear is that their object will talk back to them, disagree with them, challenge them, and if they've been a real bad boy, kill them. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, and wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will pass it to Kim. Um, well, good pitch. Um, and the the prop with the lighting, you know, woo. <laughs> um, so I I I really liked everything about this. I got hung up because I I know who she is. I know that she's on the force. I know that she's uh, she's investigating a string of murders. 
I felt like you spent a little too much time about her relationship uh, with this other woman and how, you know, I, I don't want to know all, like you were rolling, you were rolling and that just sort of hung me up and there were like little eyelash details that I didn't need to know right now um, because I wanted to focus on this main character. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I love the, I love the killer being a blow up doll and I love all of what that says. Um, I think for me, I would want, so obviously there's something at work here. There's some sort of magic. There's some sort of um, dark magic going on. And I, um, you set it up as a, as a crime thriller. I want a little indication of that somehow in the beginning of this pitch somehow that things are slightly, you know, this is Salem, you know, this is, uh, give us some sort of hint that uh, things can lurk beneath the surface because that's how this world works. Because I think it was a crime drama and then there's just a little romance and oh, by the way, a blow up doll. Yes, all those things are good, but I think the order in which I got them uh, mm -hmm. kind of put, uh, confused me a little bit in your pitch. Otherwise, I think you have a, a real fun idea for sure. Thank you. And Daniela. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a fun pitch. It's a, the I was not distracted by the doll at all. Um, no, I I I for me it was so much of like here you have this detective story and as the lead that while you have all of these relationship dynamics, I didn't understand at what point she's discovering these things and like what a her investigation is she someone that's by the book is she someone who because her colleagues are are essentially like alienating her um because of this new like personal development that she feels like she can't trust anyone um and just kind of getting a better sense of like how she's moving through her investigation because then when she discovers the doll and then realizes that she's a potential victim of the doll that there is this like I just really struggled to get a the sense of like, does she feel in a way finally seen or does she feel like, oh, this is this is just kind of aggravating like a, the hurt that she's always had. So that would just be my one recommendation as you go into like polishing the pitch of making sure that we understand those beats that get us to, um, you know, that discovery. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I like it. Uh, yeah, that that was great. That pitch was really good. Really, um, it really uh, held my my attention. It was like um, it was like a preview you would hear on the radio back in the day. <laughs> um, I guess I guess my one critique is is like um, I like the whole I like the whole idea, and I, I, I like I like the I like the idea of the blow up doll. I just want to know more about this doll. Like I know the killer's a blow up doll, and, and I just want to like like what does it look like like how is it the, the doll behind you like how would it kill like what like uh, I just would want to know more about that more about the actual horror itself mm -hmm. cool great thank you this is so very helpful all your feedback was great thank you all right and thank you so much Maggie great job thank you bye guys thanks bye all right, we are down to our final pictures. I'm gonna bring them up now. Okay, we have our final pictures of today. We have Jacob Staudenmeyer and Nishant R. And these are 10 expressive words that describe them. And they say these are a bit absurd. <laughs> they are silly, collaborative, enthusiastic, dynamic, symphonic, pretentious, game-changing, malnourished, fast, and cheap. And today they will be pitching The Last Supper. Take it away, guys. Um, firstly, thank you, Danita, as well as the whole team. And thank you all so much for letting us do this and giving us this opportunity. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, just to introduce ourselves again, I'm Nishantar. And I'm Jacob Stonmeyer. And our feature film is a biblical story, but not just any biblical story. It's a biblical whodunit. Now, we know that that might sound a little absurd. And in fact, the idea for the film did start as a joke between the two of us. But we quickly realized that the story had a lot more potential. See, Jacob and I were both raised in intensely religious households, and we've both struggled to maintain our faiths as we've gotten older. This struggle with faith turned out to be the perfect thematic through line 
for our biblical whodunit that we call the Last Supper. Imagine a tone and eclectic ensemble similar to Knives Out just set at the Last Supper. You'll be laughing at the over-the-top premise and exaggerated characters until you're suddenly drawn in by our compelling mystery. When the 12 apostles gather on Mount Zion with Jesus for a final meal, Jesus ominously predicts that one of them will betray him that very night. However, moments before Jesus can utter the name of the traitor, his wine glass slips from his hand and shatters to the ground. His body goes limp and he topples over, dead, poisoned. The film is set almost entirely on Mount Zion as the apostles, who are trapped indoors by a torrential downpour, are throwing out these wild accusations and theories um, in their attempt to identify the killer. Naturally, Judas, who's a tragic character who has lost his faith in God and Jesus and was actually planning to betray Jesus to the Romans that night, is first on the list of suspects. But when casting Judas out fails to prevent more bodies from dropping, the remaining apostles quickly realized that the murderer is still amongst them. Was it the jealous Andrew, always overlooked by Jesus in favor of his brother Peter? Or was it the religious fanatic Simon, who found Jesus' nonviolent methods ineffective? Or the power-hungry John, who believed he could replace Jesus? Everyone has a motive, and everyone's faith is in question. And just as this paranoid group is descending into chaos with no one to guide them, an unlikely detective appears, not man, not God, but a holy combination of both in the form of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Come back three days ahead of schedule with the singular purpose of solving his premature murder. And his only ally, the guilt-ridden Judas, who has returned to the scene of the crime, hoping to find redemption. The two of them together, they comb through the clues and interrogate the suspects, ultimately leading to the discovery of a terrible evil festering in the heart of Mount Zion. It all hurtles towards this violent but cathartic conclusion in which Judas must cement his renewed faith and save his fellow apostles through an act of sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting spin on a story <laughs> um, that we all know about. Uh, so great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I will pass it to Tyler. Uh, that was great. That was, that pitch was awesome. You guys, uh, the back and forth. You guys are like EPMD. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that that was, that was awesome. I love movies like this, like murder mystery movies, like contained movies with, with a storm and so you know, like Knives Out. You mentioned it almost reminds me of like Key Largo or something like that. And uh, I I don't know. I, I, it just drew me in. I love the like you know setting the story. Um, and it could be huge. I, I live in the south, and like man, that could that that would be really fucking huge. But you know, I, I really liked it. it. It kept my interest. I thought the pitch was great. I thought the idea was great, and, and that's it. Great job. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, Daniela. Yes, I was so tickled by it in the sense that I was like, where are they going to go with this? And it's like, then Jesus came, resurrected three days earlier. And I was just like, okay, I mean, you're having sold at the beginning when you were like, it's the whodunit. Oh, such a familiar story. And that like invention and kind of like having me look at something so familiar through this new lens, I was already so engaged. I really don't have any notes. I just think that you guys have, were clearly very rehearsed, but have so much passion for what this is. And there's relevance on so many different levels. Like if you're struggling with your faith or if you're like, I fully know what this story is. Um, there's so much like uh, potential here. So great job. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like, I love the Agatha Christie, like everyone's trapped on the train, everyone's trapped on the island. And, and we, we know these people um, I think it's going to be really exciting to get into the quirkiness of who these apostles are, who like at one point are just names on biblical, you know, chapter headings, hey. but to give them quirks and to give them um, backstory and, uh, and, and, and uh, interactions. Like I, I think I, uh, and, and the, the sheer irreverence is, is lovely. And, and also I, I was 
taken in the beginning. And then I thought to myself, please, 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 please pull it off at the end. Please pull it. And then when you say a darker evil lurks, like, bam, you've got me right there. Yeah. I want to know that the freaking darker evil is lurking. And I, Jesus coming back, you know, with the Sherlock Holmes hat, like super <laughs> fun. Like all of this is it super is. funny to me, but I don't think he would have pulled it off unless I knew that the darker evil was lurking. And I think that cemented it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Wonderful job, guys. That was a great pitch. Good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate you guys letting us do this. Thank you. All right. Bye. Yeah, do, we, do we leave now? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> Before answering. <laughs> um, okay. So now we have heard all of our pitches and thank you to our amazing judges for giving such great feedback to our writers. Um, we have completed all the pitches um, and now our judges will go deliberate and when they come back, we will announce our winner and this will all be live. So we will now go and deliberate. All right, welcome back to our judges and a few of our finalists are here. Um, we have come to our results for our virtual pitch competition and we are excited to announce our winners. Um, so will our nominated juror announce the winners, please? Hi, I'm the nominated juror. Speaking on behalf of all the jurors, um, so I mean, you can call me four person. Uh, congratulations, you guys. Um, it just was such a thrill to hear your pitches. Uh, and so I'll just I'll just cut to the chase. In third place, uh, congratulations to Pig and Bear. <laughs> uh, in second place, uh, congratulations to Diary of a Mafiosa. Thank you. As a result, uh, the first prize goes to The Last Supper. Congrats, everyone. Thank you. All right. Congratulations to our winners. And, you know, just congrats for even doing this on such a short notice and it's, you know, three minutes, it's very hard, but you guys did a wonderful job. And thank you to our wonderful judges on giving great feedback and just a great deliberation session too. This was very fun to hear you guys deliberate. Um, and I want to say thank you to everyone watching as well, our audience and viewers for tuning in. This was such an amazing experience, and I always enjoy doing virtual pitch events with um, all of our amazing finalists, and we hope to see you back here again at our next virtual pitch, which will be in the fall, but congratulations again to our winners today, and we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Have a good Thank one. You. Uh, thank you Thank so you. much. Congrats.